Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Thank you for joining me once again as we try to document the insidious approach of nuclear Armageddon. We got a lot of things to talk about today. In particular, we need to talk about this deployment of the U.S. military by the Ukraine border. That is not getting nearly the media attention that it should. We also need to talk about the specificity of the predictions that have been made or the allegations that have been now made from the Russians with respect to this nuclear dirty bomb business. Boy, is there a story to tell here. So you're going to want to stick with me for that. We're going to talk about the simultaneous nuclear exercises that are currently taking place. Now, this is an Iskander missile. This is very important in, we're going to explain why in just a minute with respect to this whole dirty nuclear bomb business. Okay, we're going to talk about the Polish Senate passing a resolution which basically puts them at war with Russia. We're going to talk about Finland now allowing nuclear weapons on their, uh, in their country basically or basically setting it up so that they can have nuclear weapons on their country. What that is going to mean, we're going to talk about the... Uh, third in command of the Russian military, Ramzan Kadyrov, calling for Ukrainian cities to be wiped off the map. The implications of that, the seizure of $630 billion in Russian assets, what it's going to mean for the global economy. We're going to talk about the convoy prote protests here in Canada. And apparently now they're saying that that too perhaps was mastermind by v Mad Vlad himself. We're going to talk about nationalism and multinationalism to round it all out. But guys, let's just jump right into this. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of today's video, and boy, is there a lot to talk about. We need to talk about this. Thank you to the old man who recommended this to me. You know who you are. You're very wise. I like to argue with you, but you always educate me. And this is a great book. This is actually Nuclear War and Survival Skills, a 2022 edition. They even have Ukraine and Russia in the title. So written in 1979, so there's not a lot of illustrations, not a lot of color to it, but uh, very, very informative. This is a compendium of every single thing you would possibly want to know about nuclear war survival, and it's been updated, even though there's parts of it that are perhaps a little bit dated, but I think by and large it's pretty good. But I have to read you the first paragraph of this book is something that everybody on this planet needs to read. Now, I have wrestled with the plausibility of nuclear war survival for a long time. And it's only been in this last year and speaking with the experts that I have been speaking to that I now understand and it now makes sense to me that a lot of people have fundamental misconceptions about how exactly it's going to play out. And remember, a lot of this is theoretical. It's informed by the movies. Now, listen to this first paragraph. Chapter 1, first paragraph, an all-out nuclear war between Russia and the United States would be the worst catastrophe in human history, a tragedy so huge it is difficult to comprehend. Even so, it would be far from the end of human life on Earth. The dangers from nuclear weapons have been distorted and exaggerated for varied reasons. These exaggerations have become demoralizing myths believed by millions of Americans. That right there cuts to the heart of the matter. People need to understand that not only is nuclear war survivable, that's part of the problem. You're likely not going to go out with a bang. You're going to go out with a whimper. And there's going to be a whole lot of suffering that accompanies it if you do not prepare for it. I used to believe that the people in charge, that shadowy cabal that ruled the world, that they weren't stupid enough to do it. But I'm starting to actually think otherwise. While working with hundreds of Americans building expedient shelters and life support equipment, I have found that many people at first see no sense in talking about the details of survival skills. Why would you if you thought the world was going to end? Those who hold exaggerated beliefs about the dangers from nuclear weapons must first be convinced that nuclear war would not inevitably be the end of them and everything worthwhile. Only after that, have they begun to question the truth of these myths? Do they become interested under normal peacetime conditions in acquiring nuclear war survival skills? Even these nuclear war simulation videos that are being circulated in the mainstream media, they talk about the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. Guys, there's 8 billion people on this planet. That means there's going to be a lot of people left fighting over whatever remains because when the industrial agriculture 
system and the logistical network and the supply chain completely collapse because of the war, they're not, there's not going to be enough stuff to go around to feed everybody. And of course, nobody has the skills, the self-sufficiency skills now needed in order to be self-sufficient. Anyways, uh, you can get that book through the link in the description. It supports the channel and thanks again to the wise old man. Now, we need to talk about what's going on. So we have two nuclear exercises simultaneously occurring. This is some footage of the uh, Russian nuclear exercise. They're basically testing out everything from SLBMs, that's submarines, to their land-based land mobile platforms. That's what you're seeing here. This is an ICBM. That is a, well, that's not, not a nuclear missile, but that's the delivery system for the nuclear missile. This thing will hit its target in the United States or Canada in less than 45 minutes, probably more like a half an hour. It will probably hit its target in Europe. They won't use these, they'll use a different kind. That will hit its target in under an hour, probably a couple minutes if they're using their hypersonic weapons. So they're having these exercises right now. What's concerning me about this is a lot of people are saying, oh, these are scheduled exercises. Yes, they are scheduled exercises. However, I am concerned that because these, uh, the, the timing of all of this and because the, the training is so fresh now in people's minds, that if you are confident in your ability to launch such an offensive, then that will increase the likelihood that you might potentially actually do something. That's what I'm concerned about. And we need to under, understand that the nuclear strategy of the Russians and possibly the Chinese as well, according to the late great Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, is that they believe that a nuclear war is winnable. Contrary to what we say they believe, they actually have a doctrine of nuclear survival. I'm gonna talk about nuclear doctrines and why they're kind of BS in a minute, but let's get to the, the, the heart of the matter here. Now we need to talk about the, what should we talk about first? Uh, let's talk about the, the dirty bomb stuff because that, that is unreal. Now, where is my information? Okay, so you guys know that Sergei Shoigu, the top Russian military guy, was contacting all of the NATO, his NATO counterparts, the defense ministers of all the various countries, including India and China, repeatedly to warn them. Well, I'm going to say warn because remember, the United States is saying that this is all just Russia creating the pretext for a false flag, okay, so that they can detonate a nuclear bomb and blame it on the Ukrainians. Of course, the Russians are saying the complete opposite. So everything in quotes here. Now, that was pretty vague when that information first came out. But here is what they're saying. And this is why I showed you a picture of a Russian Iskander missile. Now, the Kiev regime, this could be nuclear tipped. The Kiev regime, this, this is according to the Russians now. They are saying that the Kiev regime prepared a dummy Iskander ballistic missile filled with nuclear waste to detonate in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Early reports indicated that the Kiev regime would fill uh, ammunition, the depleted uranium or whatever it is they're going to use, or this, uh, sorry, this Iskander missile with nuclear waste and launch it using some sort of, uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know, a, I know what kind of delivery system they're going to use for this, but let's just carry on. Uh, the latest information has indicated that the Russian missile dummy can be shot down in the zone of a Chernobyl nuclear power plant where the radioactive background is already high. So this would be a very clever way to do it if you did it because you wouldn't be contaminating another zone, right? We're going to talk about who benefits from this and who I think is telling the fib here in just a minute. The aim is then to display the fragments of an alleged Russian missile for Kiev to claim with the West that Russia attacked Ukrainian soil with nuclear weapons. Initially, information appeared that the Ukrainian side could set up everything in such a way the strike was caused by Russian troops from the territory of Belarus. The goal, of course, being to accuse the Republic of 
Belarus of engaging in a nuclear war with the Ukraine or aiding and abetting the Russians to that effect. This, of course, would bring Poland and quite possibly the United States, not quite possibly, very likely the U States, the United States into the conflict zone, whether they would immediately engage with the Russians. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, I mean, the specificity of that prediction I mean, they're talking about the location, they're talking about how they're going to do it. And of course, the reason why they would do it would be to bring NATO into the, the fight. Now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that this is what is actually going to happen. For all I know, this could just be the Russians setting the stage for something else. But we have to ask ourselves, who would benefit from such a thing? Well, it really depends on who wins the big battle that is about to take place in Kyrgyzstan. And that will really determine, that will really determine who is going to benefit. Now, if the Russians are losing in Kyrgyzstan and they get sent packing back beyond the river and they have to abandon, you know, billions of dollars worth of military equipment and a lot of people as well and have a lot of people taken prisoner, then they may benefit from such an incident because that would give them the pretext they need in order to launch a tactical nuclear strike that would basically force a timeout. Because after that, all bets are off. Of course, what that will do then is bring NATO into the fight. So even along that uh, line of thinking, it's likely not good for the Russians in the long run because no matter what happens, NATO comes into the fight. Whether Ru Russia detonates a dirty bomb or not, NATO is going to be actively involved. Now, how is NATO going to get actively involved is the question. Well, because the 101st Airborne is deployed on the Romanian-Ukrainian border, it's likely, I think, that they're going to come in in the capacity of some sort of peacekeepers. They're not going to immediately start engaging the Russians. They're going to go to a place where the Russians don't currently occupy, like Odessa or some other region like that that's down here in the south. Okay, and they're going to go there. They could potentially go there even if the Ukrainians are losing in Kyrgyzstan. I think the idea was if the Ukrainians are losing in Kyrgyzstan, they're going to stage this dirty bomb thing and that is going to say, oh, well, now we have to go in there to intervene or try to uh, stifle the progression of the Russian offensive, which is supposed to kick off in the next two months because, of course, now they have a, a troop force which is 10 times what it once was. Maybe not 10 times, but it's a lot bigger than what it once was. And I'm talking just of Russian soldiers as well as Chechens, not the uh, Donbass and the People's Republics and the, the militaries of the four annexed territories, which comprise the bulk of the fighting force in Ukraine. So this is what we would call mission creep, okay? Now mission creep, the definition is a gradual shift in objectives during the course of a military campaign, often resulting in an unplanned long-term commitment. So what happens is the United States in this 101st Airborne creeps on in and under the guise of we need to protect uh, a part of the map, maybe not engaging Russians right away, but of course, then the likelihood of engagement becomes more so. And the reason how they could do this is that NATO, it's not just about Article 5 being evoked if there's a threat on NATO territory, because recall the whole coalition of the willing thing that happened in Iraq, you know, Saddam has WMDs, we need to go in there because it's a threat to other people, it's a threat to us. So they can just say that they're going into Ukraine as to, in a preemptive fashion in order to, that the national security of any NATO country depends on it, worried about spillover from the Ukraine conflict. That is the, the pretext that they will use to get in there and do that. Now, the Russian ambassador of the United States told Newsweek that this would be disastrous if this occurred. But what we have here is a game of chicken. We have the United States increasingly trying to get as close as they can to the conflict and seeing what sort of response is going to elicit from the Russians. And they're just kind of tiptoeing in. They're sending more and more weapons, bigger weapons, more long-range weapons, uh, more advanced 
weapon systems, and then now it's slowly sending the troops there. That's mission creep. Now we're committed. Okay, we're almost, we're almost in bed with this fight because now, of course, you've pissed the Russians off so much that they're going to have to, or in their minds, they're going to want to take over the entire country now, which means that they're not going to be too far from where the 101st Airborne is currently located. Now, I know a lot of people think that uh, because we've been fooled by the movies, okay, to think that these guys are going to swoop in there and they're going to kill 100 Russians for each guy because, like I say, that's what the movies have convinced. But how are they going to get in there? They're not going to get in there by plane because it'll be shot down immediately by the Russians' missile defense system, I'm, I'm assuming, right? They're, they're not going to be able to hide from Zircon missiles traveling at hypersonic speeds that can't be intercepted. So what I'm trying to say is they're not going to have the full spectrum dominance over the battlefield that they've been accustomed to since World War II, right? In Korea, in uh, Vietnam, in all these places, these elite squads had that full spectrum dominance over the battlefield for the most part, okay? A lot of it is asymmetrical warfare, which is a bit different, but still there, it's not the same is what I'm trying to say. So realistically, 5,000 guys up against like uh, what, what they're now saying is like a 1 million strong Russian mobilization. They're keeping the numbers under wraps. They're saying officially 300,000, but a lot of people are speculating that it's more like 1.1 million is just foolish, you know, regardless of, regardless of the, any sort of discrepancy in, in um, technological sophistication of weapon systems and then fighting a grinding enduring conflict with a formidable adversary you know i don't think the u.s weapon systems have necessarily proven themselves in that respect whereas again you know going back to things like the kalishnikov or the ak-47 or, or things like that where these things are built they're not built to be the most sophisticated machines but they're going to work time and time again and while they may lack sophistication they make up for in quantity and sheer abundance so I think that uh, assuming that this 101st Airborne is going to make a substantial difference, don't make a difference, don't get me wrong, they're going to do something if they engage. But understand that as soon as bullets, as soon as there's a gunfight between Russians and Americans, you're literally just a couple steps away from nuclear war at that point. And uh, the problem is right now is that, you know, we talk about this stuff every day, this is the, the reality that we're living in right now. But 90% of people haven't the faintest idea that this whole dirty bomb row is even a thing. Most people, you go up and talk to them in the street. Are you familiar with the, you know, the Russian uh, allegations of Ukraine dirty bomb? They won't be able to tell you. you know, they, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. And so this is the reason why, um, if they wanted to, if Russia was to do it right now, in spite of Sergei Shoigu's attempts to reach out to all of the, his counterparts in India and China as well, uh, it wouldn't matter because most people will still believe it. Uh, most people don't understand this backstory that we've been talking about. And that's, you know, it's going to be, let's go to war for Ukraine. And uh, all of this happening right around the time of the election, this whole battle the, the dirty bomb stuff, the 101st Airborne. I mean, guys, I'm not saying that the Russians don't lie, okay? I, I've been calling the Russians on their BS throughout this whole thing, especially, you remember when right before the war started, two days before it started, they said they were de-escalating, and I said, no, this is, this is not, they're not really de-escalating. De um, and of course they weren't. And a lot of people said, see, like a lot of the, the Russian bros were like, yeah, see, they're, they're de-escalating. They're never going to invade. And a lot of the guys right now who I still do respect, who are the Russian bros, they, they consistently get things wrong because they're always taking the Russians on their word. And you can never take anybody in this conflict on their word. There is information that is intended to be consumed by us, the public, and they serve up propaganda on both sides. Now, granted, our propaganda apparatus are far more sophisticated. Um, it's just far more ubiquitous, and there's Western hegemony is a real thing. And, you know, the Russians aren't really that good 
at theatrics. They're good at being, object being objectivists in the context of war, but in terms of like their propaganda and PR campaign, they're absolutely horrendous. So, yeah, uh, you can't trust either side. Both sides are going to lie through their teeth and say that de-escalation is, you know, is occurring. So I'm not 100% when the Russians say this is all just a ploy to bring NATO into the conflict. It may well be. It may well be. And I, I will say that Ukraine seems to stand to benefit more if it happens, especially in that exclusion zone, because it's already kind of screwed anyways. Like it's already contaminated. So what better place to do it than there where you don't contaminate, uh, you know, your, and there's not going to be a whole lot of people going in there to, to do a lot of research and inspection anyways, because it's, it's, it's very isolated, right? So you, you can go there, you just can't go there for long. So now it's just going to be, well, you can't go there for even uh, longer periods of time or shorter periods of time, I should say. So, yeah, that's very, very concerning. Um, I think I already, yeah, I already explained that. So what should we talk about next? We got this issue with Finland, who will allow NATO to place nuclear weapons on the border with Russia. This is from Newsweek. Now, they haven't been fully accepted into NATO yet. I don't know when that officially is going to happen. But all this is saying is that there's no restrictions on their membership. That means that as soon as they sign on, that is, they're not going to impose any sort of restrictions on what NATO can do. That could mean the transit of nuclear weapons through their territory or the placement of nukes on their territory. Now, Finland is spitting distance from St. Petersburg on the map. Let me just see if I can pull it up here for you. Yeah, so St. Petersburg, Baltic Sea. This is St. Petersburg. This map is all in uh, Ukrainian. So this is St. Petersburg. This is Finland right here. So right now it doesn't really matter because... The U.S. has nukes all over Europe. And, of course, France and and U.K. have their own nuclear weapons, which could reach Moscow relatively quickly without the use of hypersonic missiles. And not all of them would be intercepted by Russian missile defense. But to have it right on your doorstep, like to know that St. Petersburg could be nuked in literally less than a minute, because right now... In Kaliningrad in particular, uh, the Russians can, can strike the UK with nukes in less than two minutes, they are claiming. Okay, so this is the, the exclave of Kaliningrad right here. They can virtually hit almost anywhere in Europe in just a couple minutes with the Zircon nuclear tipped missile. Um, and you know, I mean, uh, all, any of their missiles can, can hit these regions in a relatively short period of time that wouldn't allow for much reaction time. It's more so the symbology of it. And of course, Finland and Russia have a, a history as many of you know. So I think that that would just be, you know, what we're seeing here is a constant game of chicken the united states and nato seeing what the russians will allow because the russians keep saying red lines red lines but they've yet to really act on it they've yet to push back you know we had the the crimean bridge we've had the attacks on belgorod which is a russian city that are constant we've had we have many other attacks within russian territory be it cyber or sabotage or otherwise we had the Nord Stream pipeline blowing up of course all of these things the west is saying the russians did come on guys let, let's let's just let's cut the bs for a second here okay uh now you have troops on the border of ukraine literally in spitting distance so the question is what will the russians tolerate will they tolerate u.s troops in odessa will they tolerate polish troops in lviv eventually they're going to push back and that's where it escalates and it appears as though that the u.s is trying to do whatever they can and nato's trying to do whatever they can to get as close to this problem without really pushing back now for all the people who think that the 101 airborne is going to go in there like captain america superheroes whatever we even brainwashed to think and they're just going to save the day i mean ask yourself why they're not there already you know ask yourself why they're not 
fighting the Russians already. Well, we know why. Because they're concerned about the Russian capabilities. If this was, if North Korea didn't have nukes, North Korea would have been taken over a long time ago, or it would have been the same thing that happened to Libya and Iraq. Nuclear weapons, like I said, as much as you might not like the countries who wield them, they're like the Second Amendment of the planet. They're, they're every nation's firearm and means to protect themselves. And we need to understand that there is, I hate using this word because it's so politically tainted, but there is a multinational globalist agenda at work that seeks to, this is why, you know, it always confused me. Like, why is Trump, a guy who's very hard right, you know, why is he um, being aligned with Putin, countries that are historically more socialist and communist, and even China to an extent now, why are these countries, why are these people being aligned? And it's because they're all nationalists. Okay, the, the, the globalists don't like nationalists because they put their nation's interests ahead of the global interests. And that's really what it all boils down to. And it's just uh, the simplest way of understanding why you can have hard right and hard left being unified in their nationalism and being the ire of globalists around the world. Um, did I talk about nuclear doctrines and why they're bullshit? I can't remember because... It's been 26 minutes. Nuclear doctrines are about as good as the paper they're written on. You know, you always hear the Russian bros talking about, well, it's the nuclear doctrine and the Russians can't do anything against the doctrine. Yeah, they can. I mean, they're so loosely, ambiguously worded, these nuclear doctrines. You know, the doctrine is written as such that we cannot, or the Russian nuclear doctrine is written so that the Russians cannot utilize their nuclear weapons unless they feel like their existence is under threat. Well, guess what? Every single military on the planet has in their title Department of Defense, okay? So it, it, every nation on earth, every imperialist nation on earth has used, uh, has done preemptive offensives in order for the purpose of defense. So that definition uh, or that idea that they couldn't just, you know, MacGyver a, a definition in there that would, that would suit them at the time is foolish. They could easily say that anything is a threat to their existence in the long run. A guy, you know, shooting a guy in their country is, could potentially create a chain reaction that would be, you know, that would cause the collapse of their society. Like Putin, for instance, being taken out might... Um, collapse their society. Now, obviously within reason, but what I'm trying to say is there's plenty of situations, like we're so deep in it now, that there's plenty uh, exceptions that could be made to these principles. And principles are just that. Principles are not hard and fast natural laws. Uh, the doctrine could easily be circumvented. So, yeah, I don't believe this when people say uh, Russia, you know, it's against their nuclear doctrine to do this and that. N that, you know, we don't even know what their true strategy actually is. Like, for example, this Ramzan Kadyrov guy. Um, Putin just put him third in command of the military. Why would he do that? This guy just called for Ukrainian cities to be erased from the earth. Putin is trying to keep a bit more of a low profile than that, okay? This is not the guy who you want to be uh, given the microphone when you're trying to negotiate or, or be diplomatic. He's basically saying that Ukrainian cities should be erased from the earth because of the incursions into Russian territory, which is, you know, an the annexed territory. And um, you put a guy in this in there for a reason. It just occurred to me the other day. You put him, um, Sorovkin, the General Armageddon, and you put all these guys around you close to the throne so that the West knows that if Putin goes, these guys are going to be far more militant if they actually get into power. And there's, it's not beyond the realm of possibility for this guy to actually become the president someday. I mean, you have Dmitry Medvedev, who is far more outspoken about nuclear war and the four horsemen of the apocalypse and Armageddon, who is still in line. So 
you, what you're seeing is Putin, compared to all these guys, looks like the most reasonable guy in the room. So that almost discourages the West from wanting to take him out by some kind of coup or uh, you know, try to oust him from power somehow by destabilizing the country because you know whoever gets in there is likely going to be a lot worse and they're probably going to be more quick to push the button. I mean, if this guy, if, if, what he's, if it's not just a show, then he probably would have you know, lobbed a tactical nuke a long time ago. So, you know, just something to consider anyways. Um, a Polish Senate has passed a resolution that designates Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. This could very well be Poland's pretext for entering the conflict in Lviv. Now, is Russia, you know, I mean, Russia is very far away from Lviv right now. Lviv is this other uh, city which is historically a very Polish city, somewhere around here, somewhere. I can't read this, this uh, what is it called, Cyrillic or whatever it is. Um, anyways, Russia's like way occupied over here. I don't even think if Poland went in there right now, it would be that much of a big deal yet. Yes, it would likely set off a, a chain reaction of escalatory events that it eventually resulted in the encounter of the Russians and the Poles, but it's not going to happen overnight. Even the U.S. could probably enter into Odessa or mission creep their way, you know, into just uh, Moldova or something like that and uh, slowly kind of work their way towards it. And I don't think you're going to see much of an immediate reaction because Russia is never quick to react. But it's definitely going to commit us more to the fight. And of course, once you have that engagement between Russian and uh, American soldiers, and Russians are going to be faced with the, with the, um, the what, what would I call it? Um, faced with the, the decision as to whether or not they should shoot the plane out of the sky, like take out the, the American military base, whatever base they erect there, and then, of course, run the risk of, because if they don't do that, and then they let this gateway, this portal into Ukraine continue to flourish, then, of course, they run the risk of having a much bigger problem later on down the line. Of course, if they do attack the Americans as they're moving into this, this or starting to take up a position in Ukraine, then, of course, the, it immediately escalates. So, <clears throat> I don't know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Apparently, they're trying to, uh, Ursula van der Leyen is trying to encourage the world to seize Russian assets, $630 billion of gold and foreign, foreign currency reserves. And this is fundamentally why the rest of the world is silent. Uh, and when I mean the rest of the world, I mean the big players in the world. They, they see the writing on the wall. They see that if the United States and Europe can steal, which effectively is what this would be, whether or not you believe that the Russians should be held accountable and pay reparations for what's happened in Ukraine or not, this is still essentially stealing. So whether or not they should be allowed to steal this $630 billion, and when countries see that, they're not going to want to hold dollars. Okay, They're not going to want to entrust their resources into European banks and into the hands of um, these uh, NATO players. So it's going to backfire. It, it always will backfire. And remember that the big strategic battle being fought here, a war, is the economic one on a global scale. If Russia can succeed, even if they lose, even if they get chased all the way back to the line and the end result of it is the dissolution of NATO, then they've won. Then they've won. Because that will mean that eventually, someday, Europe will be weaker, they'll be less unified, and then Russia can subvert it by other means. The convoy protest in Canada, I just briefly read up on this. Um, apparently, now they're saying that foreign adversaries may have orchestrated this whole thing or may have influenced it. This is coming out of a report done by the OPP, which is basically like the state troopers in Ontario. They like handing out uh, speeding tickets and stuff like that. And uh, they were, well, they do a lot more than that, but you know what I mean. 
<clears throat> a lot of people have issues with the OPP, much more than they do like city police and RCMP. But anyways, they um, had this report where they claim that they have evidence that the Russians were orchestrating this whole thing. And what is their evidence? Well, get this, big evidence. This is, according to the OPP, the Ontario and Ontario MP gave an interview to Russia Today. So that's, that's it. That's, that's their evidence. Now, CSIS has found no evidence of this. So they're like our CIA, Canadian CIA. And they said they have no evidence that the Russians have been <laughs> manipulating and uh, orchestrating these protests. But there have been some claims that fake accounts have been set up by Facebook to cheerlead this stuff. Now, look, let's not be naive. If I was a another country and I was at war with the United States or Canada, I would have a whole army of people, maybe not orchestrating the thing, but I would be in there like a dirty shirt. I would, especially if it was a hot button contentious issue that you know you could stir up drama, why not put a thousand guys on the computer and just turn them loose and make that their day job just to row people up and, and get people radicalized? Why wouldn't you do that? Because it's easy money, right? So of course they're doing that. Now, that doesn't mean that the convoy didn't have legitimate grievances or anything like that. It just means that those are often going to be exploited. And unfortunately, the government will now use that as justification to crack down. Just like I said in the last video, they're already making the connection. This was front page CBC today. So you know they want it on the minds of the masses that the Russians are now trying to sow discontent in Canada. And any, any discontent we have, whether it's uh, the rejection of various health-related policies or otherwise, it's all the Russians. <clears throat> what else do we got? Oh, the Democrats have retracted their calls for peaceful negotiation. Apparently, 30 Democrats had signed this letter, which was uh, supposedly pro- diplomacy, pro-peaceful negotiation with the Russians over the Ukraine issue because they see that we're approaching zero day. They see that nuclear war is now in visual range. But they retracted this. Apparently, the letter hadn't been vetted, whatever that means. Now, this just goes to show, and it's a testament to the complete paucity of independent thought within these, this, uh, what do they call it, uh, bipartisan, you know, two-party system. It, that even if you do disagree, this just goes to show that somebody has to, you know, vet and approve that thing. So even if there was 30 people who voiced their perspectives and weren't advocates for the endless printing of money to send to Ukraine, it wouldn't matter. So yeah, and that, that just proves that there's definitely some sort of political agenda going on here with respect to the elections. All of these things happening at once. The biggest battle of the war about to be waged in Kyrgyzstan, the U.S. military right on the border. All of this nuclear bomb hype that is going on or the nuclear dirty bomb hype. Uh, something, is, something is really, something is bound. I would be very, very surprised if, a major incident that didn't pull the United States into the war in the next couple of weeks. I would be very surprised at this point, but we've seen, you know, these things seem to happen on longer timelines than we estimate. You also have the North Koreans who Anthony Blinken is saying that they're planning on doing a nuclear test before the end of the year. I, I take the U.S.'s word on this one because I don't think they have any reason to lie. And I don't think they're going to do anything about it. Uh, Japan, the United States, and South Korea are all saying that they're going to pledge harsh responses for, for such a thing. For if the uh, North Koreans do, I think, their seventh test. I think it's the first one they've done since 2017. But what are they going to do? They're going to sanction them some more. They're not going to go to war because then that would mean China would go to war. And then that would mean World War III because right when that happened, you know something would heat up on the Ukrainian front. So the moral of the story is, folks, uh, you should probably get this book, Nuclear War Survival Skills, because unfortunately, it's survivable. And, you know, it, it's uh, civilization ends with a whimper, not a bang. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoy the video. Canadian Prepper out.